For months I've been investigating the supply chain for methamphetamine, mostly ice or crystal meth. It's just come off a block, the two bags here, just to show you. They're huge. Following high level traffickers, dealers, cooks, runners, enforcers. I'm loyal to the people I'm with and I'm aggressive and violent to protect them. Retracing the journey the drug takes from its source in Southeast Asia to the people who control the trade there, powerful militia and secretive Chinese syndicates. If you were to describe the triads in one word, what word would you use? The ruthless. Coal. We've never been more challenged. It's relentless. It's 24-7. Australia is one of the most lucrative meth markets. Last year, we shot up, smoked and snorted around 10 and a half tonnes of meth, a 17% increase on the year before. We spent about $10 billion on the drug. It's easy to get, it's easy to use, it's reasonably cheap. But the consequences are devastating. The humiliation, the judgement, the segregations. I've travelled thousands of kilometres along the meth pipeline to investigate the trade and to hunt a man believed to be one of the drug barons behind it. I'm at this address waiting for a meth cook. A little bit nervous because it's taken a lot for us to convince him to be part of this documentary and to tell his side of the story. And I hope he shows up. He's here. Turn the camera off. Hello. Oh, thanks for coming. How are you? Good. Is it okay if I film? Can Sorry. she film yet or? Yes, yeah, yeah. Of course. This cook has asked me to call him Brendan. What have you got in your bag? Oh, I just bought some product just to show you how to extend the product. I won't do a cooking show, but I can briefly explain. He says he's going to explain how he cuts his ice. What's in this tub? Uh, so this is dimethyl sulfone, which is MSM. It's for um, your muscles. It's like a joint relief product. So it's good for you? It's all special right now at Chemist Warehouse. And um, it's something that liquefies and re-solidifies at the same rate that ice does. Guys like Brendan operate at the bottom of a vast global supply chain. These are just half grams. So that's a gram. How much is that worth? For good stuff, though, like street level, it should be 300, 350. Anything cheaper would be a red flag for me. At a high level, commercial trafficking level, what kind of product are they dealing with? Over 50 grams is commercial quantity. So I bought some product here that's just come off a block. And two bags here, just to show you. They're huge. The scale and difference is, yeah. It's quite massive. How much yeah. money could you make off one of those big rocks on the street? I think if you put this hell on the street, you'll get rolled. <laughs> I'll send you some more light. Cutting maximises profits by diluting the meth with a cheap substitute to bulk out the product. And Brendan's going to show me just one part of the process. And you make what is called a boat. Once it's solidified, you can break it off. Look at these little shards. If you look at the little packet earlier, I mean, it's pretty consistent. Almost identical. And you could make big amounts of this for $20. And then just go straight in. When I light it, you'll see it'll start to liquefy. 
you see the smoke starts swirling, starts moving, and then this one you'll be sucking it in, moving it forward back. You'll see it just start to get back to what looks sort of like, well, you know, the skating rink. Australia is a key market. We're among the world's biggest users. For the past 10 years, outreach workers Jane and Mike have seen the havoc firsthand. On the street, there's more chaos. There's a lot more engagement with police. There's a massive increase in what we call drug-induced psychosis, or they might call it dip. Jane says ICE has taken over. And I would say 95% of my caseload is now meth users. What are your thoughts on now? They spot a rough sleeper Jane used to work with. We can ask him. His name's Maddie, and he says he'll meet them in a nearby park. He also tells Jane and Mike he had a hit a few hours ago. He keeps saying he's going to go, and then he... He gets distracted and does something else, but anyway. And if he doesn't come in five or ten, I would guess we're probably, we'd be here for hours. Time doesn't have much relevance here. Eventually, they catch up with him. And how are things going for you at the moment? There's something going on here. <laughs> My psyche is picking up on <sighs> Maddie's paranoid police are coming for him. Yeah, he's just a homeless bum, no one. He insists on going somewhere private. OK, what about snap, crackle, pop? After about an hour and a half, he's ready to talk. How's today been for you? Um, uh, lately I've been struggling in myself a bit, you know. I was up all night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You're not sleeping at night or it's just too hard to...? No, I just... Finally got some decent ice last night. Uh, if you buy a half ball... Matty starts ball. describing his experiences on the drug. Well, I've had to do things that I don't like doing. Sometimes you can get a contaminated hit, you know? A dirty hit is quite unpleasant of unpleasance. Everyone's got their own... As I listen to Matty, I can't help but think about the meth barons swamping our streets with this devastating drug. And it can take a life, possibly, at the extremes. I want to know who's behind it. Yeah. I keep hearing about a guy who's suspected of being behind some of the large meth shipments hitting our shores. I've been trying to get his name for weeks. So far, no luck. I've decided if I really want to find him, I need to understand his world. To operate a meth syndicate, you need five things. A manufacturer, a trafficker, a door, someone who creates a hole at the Australian border, muscle, a bunch of violent people to keep everyone in line, and finally, you need distributors who get the drugs to the streets. I'm on my way to meet with a syndicate who work with a Chinese triad. The whole meeting's cloaked in secrecy and light on details. At the last minute, they give me an address. We've hit some unexpected traffic and we could potentially be a few minutes late. I'm really anxious that they might think something's gone wrong on our end or that they couldn't trust us because we're even just a few minutes late. That's how high the level of paranoia is in situations like this. Two guys meet me at the door. They're on edge. They tell me to go to the laundry. There's a heap of meth and a heap of money. It's quite a, almost like a citrusy smell. It's really, yeah, like lime or citrus. 
They say lately they've been getting undercut by Mexican cartels, who are starting to dominate this multi-billion dollar market. They tell us this is their morning's takings. So the people I've spoken to who supply large commercial quantities of methamphetamine have said that the Chinese importers will buy it for roughly one to three thousand dollars in uh, northern Thailand, but by the time they get it across the border here, they charge roughly ten to thirty thousand dollars per kilo, and then the distributors purchasing off the Chinese triads will charge roughly between sixty and seventy thousand dollars for a kilo. The profits are massive. It's taken me a while, but a former high-level distributor has finally agreed to talk. He was once near the top of the Australian meth game. It's hard to fully verify what people are saying, but their stories match a lot of what I've seen and heard during our investigation. It's really rare for anyone of this caliber to speak candidly on camera. Are we rolling? We're rolling. Who are we rolling? No. <laughs> he wants to be known as Jay. He's done time for trafficking and he started dealing when he was 14. I'm more worried about how I'm going to put food on the table. And Jay says he started selling weed. On a daily basis, I was getting like at least what, 70, 80 phone calls. Like, I couldn't even sit down to have, like, have a pop of meal, you know? The authorities say that... Uh, he tells me he moved up the chain, selling to other dealers. Then, a distributor offered him some meth. They asked me how long was it going to take to actually move the, 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 the product, and I, I told them I don't know. Because honestly, I didn't know how long I was, what I was capable of. And, yeah, it took me two days, less than two days. Soon, Jay says he was making 30 to 40 grand a week. Were you ever tempted to touch it? No, not really, because just seeing all the... everybody else having the downfall and everything else, it's disgusting. <laughs> what makes it disgusting? The fact that people see that as a priority. I've had clientels where, for example, they have the kids running around in nappies and everything. The nappies hasn't been changed in the past two, three days. Instead of them using that financial like financial funds on their own kid, they'll pass it in. It's just like, man, it's just... Yeah, but... Didn't, uh, didn't that spin you out, though, that yeah, they were paying you? And yeah, they... but it did, but at the end of the day, if they don't grab it from me, they'll grab it from elsewhere which they'll grab from elsewhere, someone else could probably give them a uh, uh, product that's even lower grade, like percentage than mine, which is, that's even, so they're not even getting their money's worth. Things have changed since Jay was in the game. A killer was a large amount of product, you know, whereas now we're talking about, we're talking about half a tonne, tons. Man, <laughs> the triads, that's where the triads come in. We triads is contracts. For example, um, what you can, capable of doing and what you yeah, promise them what you can able to do and, yeah, keeping your word to it and whatnot. Then, otherwise, they just cut you off and if not, then everything comes with the consequences and everything else. Like, you, know, you know what you signed up for. Or they know what they signed up for. One of Jay's associates says the triads guarantee delivery. If a shipment is lost, they wear the cost and send another. For years, several of those triads operated in a lucrative network called The Company. I've heard that the suspected drug baron I've been looking for has been working with what's left of that network. At its height, The Company was thought to be earning as much as $17 billion a year, more than some Fortune 500 companies. Australia was a key market. The man police allege was head of The Company, Sei Chi Lop, was arrested and eventually brought to Australia to face trafficking charges in 2021. This arrest uh, would be one of the most high profile arrests in the history of the AFP. He's awaiting committal in a Melbourne prison. Operation Kunga that started off in 2017 was a priority focus on what we call is a company, uh, a Southeast Asian syndicate that was responsible for significant imports into Australia. And through the work of the AFP, working with over 17 agencies and, and a range of countries, from our perspective, we've, we've greatly degraded the activities of that syndicate.
I'm learning more about the meth business. For months, I've been chasing a former enforcer. He's finally agreed to meet. There's a real risk he won't turn up. Hello. Johnny, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. There's only one form of regulation within the drugs trade, violence. I'm loyal to the people I'm with and I'm aggressive um, and violent to protect them. Johnny served 16 years in prison for hacking a man to death with a samurai sword. In the moment when I need to do something, it's like there's a switch. And it just click and I'm gone. This is the attitude you need to become an enforcer. I can't hold back. Even if you pull me back, I will go forward again. If I seen him bleeding, I want to see more bleeding. But that's, that's, you know, that's not normal. That's not normal. Exactly. I want to know how someone becomes muscle for a triad. Johnny tells me his life flipped in his early teens. We're, we're really loving family. I was a good, good kid at home. It is a big he says he started hanging out with a troubled kid. And within months, Johnny and the kid were roaming the streets, getting into fights. Our name us White Rose. In Asian culture, White Rose means death. Another incident happened. Johnny says he got a reputation for extreme violence, and that led to prison, where he met a senior triad. If you could only use one word to describe the triads that you've met, what would that word be? Cole. When you sit with him, you talk to him, you look at him, you can actually felt that, that coldness from him, then the power. He's a gentleman. He's very he tells me more about the triads. They very well organised. To them, business is more important than violent. They only use violent only when they needed it, but it's someone else is doing it, not them, which is smart. Right. I've heard from other sources there's a hierarchy amongst triads. Melbourne triads report to Sydney, Sydney to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to Macau, and Macau to mainland China. I wasn't trying to make a name for myself. But I, I asked Johnny to confirm, but he doesn't want to talk about it. Wasn't trying anything like I asked him about Sei Chi Lot, who's also known as Sam Gore. Police are making a big statement about the recent arrest of one Chinese triad called Selok. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they're saying that they've got the godfather of the <laughs> whole of the southeast. Yeah. What what do you make of that? <laughs> if they was the biggest person in the organization and then now they get busted, how come their organization still stands still? Who's running them? People are consuming almost as much meth as when the company was allegedly operating under Seichi Lop. And what I'm hearing is the rumoured drug baron I've been investigating is helping to keep the meth flowing. People are telling me if I want to find them and understand their trade, I need to go to Southeast Asia. My first port of call is Bangkok, where I find Patrick Wynn. Uh, your handwriting is uh, nearly as horrible. Yes. <laughs> I'm a, it's a, I'm a journalist true, after true all. Journalist. Yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> your credibility just shot yeah. off. <laughs> yes. Patrick studied Asian drug markets for a decade. It's going to Australia. They just he explains yeah, how the meth right. business works. It begins when an organized crime syndicate is looking for a place to build a meth lab. That syndicate will go into Myanmar and find an armed group. The armed group will say, yes, you can build a meth lab here. They'll usually site it next to a stream. It takes a lot of water to make meth. And uh, the armed group will take a tax of the meth production. Um, that's pretty much all they do. They make sure that it's not raided by cops. 
They usually control their own areas, like little countries, so the cops can't come in anyway. Patrick tells me drug runners take the meth from the lab in Myanmar to the border. Syndicates move it from the border to a port. From there, it's packed into legal goods, like tea or speakers, and smuggled into Australia. If there's demand on the Australian side for more crystal meth, if it's really moving, the order can go all the way back up to the meth labs in Myanmar, and they have the capacity to produce more. The flow is so heavy that even if cops do pick off this truck or that truck, they're getting, at best, 10%. It's just unstoppable. The heartland of meth production in Southeast Asia is the Golden Triangle. It's a mountainous region that covers the borderlands of Thailand, Laos and Myanmar. It's rush hour in Mai Tsai, northern Thailand. Authorities are on high alert. They're looking for drugs, mainly meth, that might have slipped across the border. Border areas like this are where the vast majority of drugs enter Thailand. This is one of the front lines in the global war on drugs. The day before we arrived, the Thai military shot and killed 15 meth smugglers trying to cross the nearby border. At a rural warehouse not far from the checkpoint, a drug smuggler starts work. <laughs> panel by panel, he shows us how he readies his scooter for an illicit cargo. <laughs> Tea bags, usually crammed with kilos of crystal meth. Every time he goes out, he risks jail or death. He's part of a vast network that stretches all the way to Australia. A dark highway of drugs which has risen more than 500% in the past decade. Okay, full cop, cop, one not more lay up, top soil. People get shot, people get killed doing this job. That could be you. He's just one of many people who make a living on the edges of the Golden Triangle's multi-billion dollar meth trade. The Golden Triangle is actually quite a big area, but this is the center of it. So we're in Thailand, about 200 meters right over there is Myanmar, and right across the river is Laos. So we're literally where it all happens. I'm standing with Jeremy Douglas at the apex of the Golden Triangle. He's led the UN's anti-drug operations here for more than a decade. How much is the meth economy in this region worth? The last time we measured it, a couple of years back, pre-COVID, was about $60 billion. But if you look at where concentrated production really takes place, it's really here. And it is in Latin America, primarily in Mexico, Central America. I asked Jeremy what role triads play here. So they've really had deep hooks into the drug trade through this country and through the surrounding countries, through Hong Kong, through Yunnan, through Macau for decades. So really their role in this today is, is what it always was, which is to essentially connect the products of these places to the markets. He says traffickers first came here for heroin in the 1970s and then introduced meth in the mid-90s. The arrival of Sei Chi Lop allegedly changed the game again. He did something unique. For the first time ever, he took crystal meth, changed the business model and mentality around how do you procure and distribute meth to the streets, and basically did that by connecting this place to Australia. It's never, never been done before. It's further up the Mekong, in Myanmar, 
where massive super labs have been producing large amounts of meth bound for Australia. I'm talking to lots of people here about the meth trade. At a local cafe, I meet a Thai general who casually drops that a key player in the global meth trade is an Australian man. He won't tell me his name. I immediately think of the alleged drug baron. We've actually managed to find someone who currently works in a crystal meth super lab. It's incredibly rare access, and he's speaking to us at great danger to himself. We're on our way to meet with him right now. I've been brought to a house on the outskirts of the border town Maasai. Hello, Mr. A. Yes. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having us. Can we come in? What exactly do you do for work? How did you get into this kind of work? Mr. A used to play the popular Thai sport, Sepak Takro, at a high level, but got injured. He says he started using and selling meth. He was taken in by a former teammate's family, who put him to work in a meth lab. How much drugs do they typically make? Is that every day? I ask him, who owns the lab? Are they Chinese syndicates? The United Wa State Army are an ethnic militia that profits enormously from the meth trade. The Wa are a people indigenous to Myanmar and China. A lot of the super labs are on United Wa State Army territory in Myanmar's Shan State. They're backed by Beijing, which turns a blind eye to Chinese organized crime, plying their trade on Wa land. I've just found out a smaller Wa militia might meet with me. They're called the Wa National Army. After several hours, I'm near the Myanmar border. We're in um, Ban Rak Thai, waiting to meet with someone from the Wa National Army, who will hopefully begin to escort us across the border into Myanmar. I don't have a lot of faith that we will get across the border tonight just because we're losing light rapidly. Our fixer is on the phone, pleading with whoever's on the other end of the line to get us across. Um, hopefully, we will. I'm not identifying our fixer because she works on both sides of the border with some serious people. After 15 minutes of wrangling, she has news. What do you think our chances are? We can cross, but... Tonight? We, not, can we cannot cross tonight. We cannot cross tonight. Yeah, but we go to talk to explain that to see okay. if we can cross tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Yeah, so you, even tomorrow's up in the air still. The Wa militia is saying they're not sure they can guarantee our security. Then they have a change of heart. We've just been told that we can cross at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. They were really nervous about the tense political situation at the moment. It's a very quiet town now. It's around 
10 o'clock and I've seen two police cars uh, kind of patrolling the area. So we're hopeful that everything's calm tomorrow morning and we can actually get across. I set out at dawn with an escort. We stop a few hundred metres from a Thai military outpost. If they see me, there could be trouble. We're about to cross the border into Myanmar. It's been extremely difficult trying to get access into the country because a recent wave of violence has inflamed the civil war there. This volatile region has different ethnic groups fighting for territory, and it's also where Australia's meth is produced. They tell me this is the first time international media has visited this base. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. From the ABC. Okay. This is Colonel Lu Mong local commander of the Wa National Army. How close is the fighting? Fighting uh, over there. You can run a half. You can run man. My make a guy mark like Pamansa. See, you can hike low cannon. Eh. Lago Tavila, Vela, Ho Ying Gano, Lago Tele Yin Siang, the Yin Siang, Pun Yai, Yin Siang. What can you hear? Ah, Jing Jing, Jing Jing, Taho, Banti Ho, Mago de Yin Cup, Lago Tele Yin Siang, Pun Yai. Lu Mong has about 200 fighters living here. I want to know how close I am to the source of meth production in Myanmar. Does the Hua National Army receive funding and support from the United Hua State Army? Hua, like me, I have. We have a conversation with each other. It's just a conversation. It's just a some of the experts that we've spoken to about this region say that wherever there are guns and militias, there's going to be drug production. What do you make of that? We can't stop it. There's a lot of people in the country. That's why they have to find a way to get it in the in the past, the Thai authorities have arrested former members for drugs manufacturing and drugs trafficking. What do you say to that allegation? Lu Mong's militia may or may not be making or trafficking the meth, but since the 1950s, Shan State militias have been benefiting from the drugs trade. Before meth, this area was known as an opium growing region. <laughs> For decades, it was controlled by the notorious narco warlord Khun Sa. He's been romanticized in popular movies. It's not the same as quitting. The former US Attorney General called him the Prince of Death. The individual primary responsible for this worldwide devastation of drug addiction is Kung Sa. Hello, Kung Sa. Hello. Uh, Welcome come in here to our place. Kun Sai Jayan was Kun Sa's PR person. We have to start with the truth. Today, we catch up with him at the office of a dissident newspaper he founded in Chiang Mai. And can you tell us a bit about this amazing jacket you've got? Well, when the village headman has something to tell the villagers, you will see a Shan beating a hollow lock. And that's your role now. Yeah. Your role now is really to hit the log and have people listen like yes. us. Most of the shans, they he says today's meth trade runs the same way as the opium trade did in Khun Sa's time. To fight against the Burmese government, 
we didn't have any foreign government supporting us. And the only source of income for us was opium, which is already there. <laughs> and in the old days, it wasn't uh, illegal. Kun Tsai says the real winners weren't the Shan. They were the Chinese and Laotian generals who controlled the trade. Journalist Patrick Wynn says the syndicates running the super labs in the Golden Triangle are usually Chinese. They might be triad affiliated, they might be full blown triads, but they don't have to be. These people are interested in business and their sons and daughters go to nice private schools and they live in normal neighborhoods and they're just really good at moving things from A to B. It really comes down to that. What exactly does the meth economy in Australia fuel in this part of the world, in Myanmar specifically? So when someone goes and buys a bag of crystal meth in Australia, um, <laughs> they're fueling a long chain that goes all the way back into the Golden Triangle, into the mountains of Myanmar. You have made a Chinese organized crime syndicate a little bit richer. You probably partially funded uh, the purchase of everything from weapons, medicine, um, you know, asphalt to pave roads in an impoverished part of Myanmar. So, I mean, it actually helps prop up Myanmar's junta as well. After months of digging, phone calls and late night meetings, I've got the name of the suspected drug baron. I discover he may be living in Vietnam or Cambodia. And I learn police are investigating him too. With a name, our team gets this Facebook video. His tattoos help identify him. They're exactly what you'd expect of a senior figure in the Asian organized crime world. But his name is Daniel Rodney Badger. This is a video of his lavish wedding in Vietnam. Badger is on the Australian Federal Police's high value target list. Is it fair to say that you'd have to be one of the major drug importers to be classified under that high value target list? Yeah, there's a range of factors to consider, but that would be one of the key factors, yes. We're sitting in AFP headquarters. Uh, there's a, a room, an ops room in this building, a windowless room, and we have pictures of all of the high value targets on, on the wall and we're just working through them one by one and ticking them off. It's a priority focus in terms of taking them out and removing their influence on the drug trade. Daniel Rodney Badger is of significant interest to the AFP. In 2016, Badger listed this public housing residence in Western Sydney as his address. Just a year later, he became a major shareholder in a multi-million dollar Vietnamese chemical and fertilizer company. The company has bonded warehouses and they say they export fertilizers to Australia. Badger sold his holdings in 2018. In 2020, he opened a car wholesale business in Ho Chi Minh City. I'm not gonna go into individual cases, but what I can say in relation to these people, uh, these high value targets offshore, we know where these people are, we know what countries they're in, uh, we know where they live, and we are coming after them. About two years ago, it's believed, Badger obtained Cambodian citizenship. He also got a new Khmer name, Savanarith Sen. We tried to contact him. I've got two phone numbers for Daniel Rodney Badger and I'm uh, going to give him a ring and put some of these allegations to him. Uh, 
the subscriber you have call is not available at the moment. Sorry, but your call cannot be completed. We sent him a list of questions, but didn't hear back. We asked the Cambodian government if they're aware of Badger's alleged activities in the meth trade, and if, given these revelations, his citizenship will be revoked. They didn't reply to our questions. Why can't the AFP stub the flow of meth on the streets in Australia? We're having an impact. We're having an impact both domestically and internationally. But unfortunately, uh, Australia still has an insatiable demand for, for drugs. International traffickers have told us that the AFP is so obsessed with seizures, uh, they've been exploiting it as a weakness by diverting your attention with dummy loads while they import tons elsewhere. Seizures of drugs is, is important, preventing drugs hitting the streets of Australia, but our priority focus is on the people that are behind the, these, these drug seizures, uh, and that's what we've tried to publicise in terms of the important work that we're, we're doing in this space. But again, I think, I think it's fair to say we've never been more challenged. Organised crime has become more globalised, it's become more sophisticated, it's become more connected. Uh, it's relentless, it's 24-7. It's Governments in the West have been fighting the flood of drugs from the Golden Triangle since the middle of the 20th century. For Australia, the front line has now shifted to meth coming in from North America. It's clear that taking out major players doesn't necessarily stop the flow. Other markets will meet it. What more could Australian authorities be doing? This is no longer a policing issue when it gets to this level of production and trafficking. And I think it's one of those things that needs to have a public discussion. It requires also a response that's political in nature. It can't simply be in the back rooms and left to police alone. Law enforcement is one part of the solution. But again, the narrative is incredibly important, particularly in relation to harm reduction. It's having such a disastrous impact on, on our community. We need to continue to tell people about that message. If this program has raised concerns for you, you can contact one of these services.